So hello everyone. I'm excited to welcome you to Notch and Micmac's weekly roundtable series. Hope you're all are staying happy and healthy. I'm Ryan Sloan, the content communications manager at Notch, and looking forward to starting off with today's topic, leading during a time of crisis. So I'd like to introduce our hosts, Anja Gonska and Rachel Tipograf, who will be leading us through this conversation with industry leaders from JP Morgan Chase, Goop, WW, NEA, and VaynerMedia. So our first host is Anja Gonska, who is the co-founder and CEO of Notch, a content intelligence platform that enables companies like Amazon, Facebook, Walmart, Bank of America, Salesforce, and others to plan for breakthrough content, as well as measure and optimize it across channels. Anda has been named to both Forbes and Inc.'s annual 30 under 30 lists, Adweek's Young Influential list, and Campaign's Female Frontier list, just to name a few. And we also have today Rachel Tipograph, who is the founder and CEO of Micmac, an enterprise marketing e-commerce platform that helps brands better understand consumers by connecting digital investments to online retailer insights. She's been recognized as a leading innovator across the globe, including Forbes 30 Under 30 Who Are Changing the World, Marie Claire's 50 Most Influential Women in America, and Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business. So Andre and Rachel, take it away. Wow. Um, we're up to 572 and it's growing, Anda. Uh, this is wild. It's Andre, are you on uh, mute? Can we hear yeah, you? Yeah, no, can you? Oh, perfect. Uh, this is totally wild. For those of you who've been tuning in the past three weeks, this literally started as a text chain between Anda and I, where we were consulting each other on how our businesses were navigating COVID-19, sharing our client challenges, and then realized, wouldn't it be great if we just brought the brightest minds in business together on Thursdays to discuss how we can all overcome these challenges. Fast forward today, we have something really special in store for you, but I thought I'd get everyone up to speed on what we've learned as a group over the last three weeks. So when Anta and I started these webinars two weeks ago, the focus uh, was really on marketers. How are marketers responding to this in real time, from their media plans to content marketing, to navigating supply chain issues if you're in consumer products, marrying that to inventory and media that you have in market, and then as important, how do you keep your teams motivated while working remotely? We learned a lot from marketers across Bank of America, Ford, Salesforce, Monster Energy, Elf Cosmetics, L'Oreal, you name it. Um, but I think a big part of the conversation that Anda and I have been yearning for is to understand how some of the world's most powerful CEOs are navigating COVID-19, because we're honestly all working from the same set of data points. And so that's what today is really about. Um, I know, Anda, you wanted to share some of the latest trends that you're seeing. Since last webinar last week, I can tell you here at Micmac, I was talking a lot about what we were seeing in terms of China and e-commerce. It's interesting, now that we're three weeks into this, uh, we're starting to see a new shift in consumer behavior. So wind the clock back two weeks ago, it was really about online grocery shopping, online booze shopping, getting the home care products that you need. Now that people are settling into their home, we're actually starting to see a rise in more entertainment-focused products. So exercise, skincare routine. So it's interesting to see how consumer behaviors are changing as we're all settling into this new routine of working from home. Anda, let me uh, know what you're seeing. Yeah, so one of the big trends um, across almost every category of marketer that we've talked to um, is this idea of moving from transactional to brand marketing. Um, even CPGs, who I initially thought were going to be a lot more focused on performance marketing during this time, are saying, no, this is the time for us to double down on being there for our customers and hope that this is going to help our brand going forward from a brand equity standpoint. And we're seeing that in the data that um, we have coming into our product from a content standpoint. Obviously, content and the creation of it is correlated with um, upper funnel and brand activities. And so what we're seeing is, even though overall the uh, volume of content has decreased by about 20% from January to March. 
um, categories uh, like financial technology, B2B consulting, auto are actually exponentially up from a production standpoint. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to see uh, them leading the charge on this front. And I'm pretty sure from our conversations in the market that a lot of the other companies are going to follow and are pushing out um, quite interesting and creative content campaigns coming up in uh, late April and early May, especially with now all sports and event marketing dollars being shifted into something. They have to shift it into something. And so that's typically what we've seen them shifted towards. Um, so that's kind of the high level of what I'm seeing. Well, uh, I think enough from us because we have some of the world's most interesting people on the line with us. Uh, for everyone who's never tuned into our webinar, I'll go over the rules of the road. We're gonna uh, interview everyone for around 20 minutes. There's a Q&A function. Submit questions. We're gonna look at them periodically. If one piques our interest, we might actually uh, ask the panelists. And uh, Anza and I are gonna keep each other in check with time, so we might rudely interrupt each other to make sure that we can hear from all of these esteemed speakers. So Anza, I know you're kicking it off, so I'm gonna let you uh, I have one more reminder for everyone that this conversation is off the record. Um, and so we're going to take some high level uh, notes as, um, as our teams are listening in and share those via email with those participating. But this is all off the record. It's just a conversation sharing kind of what we're seeing and how we can navigate through this together. Um, so I couldn't be more excited to welcome our first guest, Kristen Lemkow. Um, Kristen is the CEO of the U.S. Wealth Management at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, before that, she was the company CMO, where she was responsible for brand, media, sponsorships, data and analytics, performance marketing, and consumer communication. She has helped launch several successful products, including Sapphire Reserve, Sapphire Banking, and Freedom Unlimited. Kristen has been recognized as a leader in the industry. She was named Marketer of the Year by the Ad Club and ranked number five in Forbes um, World's Most Influential CMOs. I'm sure you have all the distinctions, Kristen. She's also been named one of the uh, entrepreneurs 50 most daring ad age, 10 power players and business insiders 50 most innovative CMOs. Um, Kristen, welcome. I think it's, Thank you. it's, it's uh, the, the thing that isn't in your bio is that um, you are a great champion of women and women entrepreneurs in particular. You were one of the first CMOs to give us a shot. Um, you know, I, I often say that you helped us build the company, even though uh, you were always in the background. So thank you so much for joining. Really excited to hear some of the insights that you have for us today. Um, and I wanted to kick it off with a question, um, a little bit around kind of brand. And of course, you're now a CEO. We're going to spend most of the time talking about you um, as a leader. But I'm just curious with your CMO hat on, how are you thinking about brand during a time of crisis? And what would be your advice to um, a lot of the marketers who I'm sure are on the line listening in right now? Sure. I think right now it's so important for people to feel like they're part of a community, even a virtual community. And as for first giving you a shot or Rachel a shot, that was one of the easiest decisions I ever made. And the person who turned me on to both of you guys was Linda Boff and Beth Comstock at GE. And I know Jeff is on here and is going to speak later. So that was a great partnership for me uh, and great friendships to follow. So for brands, I would say now is the time where brand purpose gets real. It's easy to talk about it in good times. It's easy to build ad campaigns around it. I think now is when you really see who means it and who was just marketing. Um, it's a time for all companies and all citizens to step up and do our part and seeing what brands will actually deliver and where business can step in to help out particularly financial institutions. That makes sense. Um... I'm curious, where were you in 2008? I'm assuming you were, you were at J.P. Morgan Chase. Were you the CMO at the time? No, I was running investment banking, marketing, and communications, and I was pregnant. <laughs> so not only was the world coming to an end, but I was sober during the whole thing. Uh, that's, that's yeah, important. so I remember that crisis well. Yeah, it's hard. It's hardest to be sober during a crisis. Um, what What are some of the parallels that you're seeing um, from both a economic standpoint, but also from the way you see companies reacting? Yeah, and obviously Jeff would be a great person to ask this question as well. That was a those oh, were risks. We that, what's that? You will. Oh, I said, oh, we will. 
<laughs> um, that was a situation where the risks were within the system. It was excessive leverage that led to an acute liquidity crisis, but it was, it was weakness within the system. Um, and this is obviously something that's outside the system, so it's not the result of any inherent weakness. Things were functioning in a fairly healthy way, so it's much more like a natural disaster, I, I think, um, but, but more profound even than those that we have gone through before. So when you think of 9-11 and terrorism or Katrina or Sandy, the psychological effects, the loss of life were profound. But in those cases, they were somewhat geographically isolated. That even in Manhattan, which I, and I lived downtown during that, above 14th Street, you know, people were traumatized that life was going on uh, in somewhat of a normal way, where I don't think we've ever experienced anything where the entire planet on a rolling basis is going through the same trauma and how we are all adapting to that. Um, I'd say what's similar about it is people are scared. It's an unprecedented level of uncertainty. Uh, the human loss will be more than we can bear. And it's a time where um, both individuals and companies uh, need to step up and show their best, which I think they have during those other times of crisis. Do you think the fear is more personal this time around? And what are some of the, the lessons from the, pre the tragedies you mentioned in the past and maybe some of the 2008 um, crisis that we could apply today as leaders? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's certain, there's standard leadership lessons in leading in a time of crisis. And again, Jeff and Mindy and others will be exceptional at, at answering this question. At least for me, it's important to show you're calm, you're in control, your business is running, your business is healthy. Uh, people will have jobs on the other side of this because you're doing a good job running the business. Um, you know, stylistically, I've always been a big believer that it's important to lead not just with strength, but also with vulnerability and with compassion and with humanity. And that has never been more true than it is now. Everybody is going to react to this in different ways. People will go through different levels of suffering. Some of that will be easy to observe. Some of that will be less easy to observe. So I, I think it's incredibly important to lean into your employees and your clients and uh, sort of show that you're feeling the hurt as well and letting people feel heard and making sure people feel connected. So basically walking the line between showing empathy and humanity, but maintaining control and calm, sounds like. I, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I, I think in fact, showing your humanity is a sign of strength. Mm. That's very well said. Um, do you think that large banking institutions have um, a different or an extra responsibility during a crisis like this? Yes. Yes. I mean, we have 62 million households who bank with us. We have 4 million small businesses. So it's an incredible time and, and content is an important part of it, Anda, to reach out to your clients and let you know what, what let them know what you think let them know what advice you would give. You know, I mean, I hosted a, a client call last week. We had 10,000 Verizon, Verizon lines and we maxed out uh, 10 minutes before the call started because people are so eager for information, particularly when it comes to their money. People care about their health, they care about their family, and they care about their money. And letting people know that we're here, we're at work. Our advisor sales force of 4,700 people who are extroverted people who go to offices every day, went remote in one day, went remote, it got stood up from home, it had bumps for sure, but it worked a whole lot better than expected and letting people know we're here, we're working and we're looking after your money, you worry about your family and your health. So tell us a little bit about the, the content and the calm strategy that you've put in place, especially since it's such an important part of how you communicate with customers during this time. How quickly were you able to pivot and create some of this content and where were those resources? Were they internally, externally? Yeah, well, it's interesting because we've gone old school. Like we have a lot of content that we send out that gives people sort of our best investment advice. So we've increased that. And then we've just increased the number of plain old phone calls that we have. And those have had incredibly good pickups. So 
it's been a time where we've had to innovate for what our business looks like very quickly. And I think we're trying to anticipate how this may change consumer behavior forever. Uh, but it didn't have to be overthought. Just setting up a phone call with an investment specialist is going to get 10,000 people on it. Sending out a PDF from your CIO on where he thinks he would rebalance your portfolio is going to get picked up. For, so for all the thinking that we've done about innovation around content, it's actually been the old school stuff. It's the it's the richness of the insight more than the delivery mechanism that's been important for us. Totally. Um, curious, as you mentioned, the entire team went remote in one day. How are you now thinking as a leader about keeping them motivated? Um, and also, I don't know if you've noticed this, Kristen, but I was initially concerned about productivity. And then I actually now see the opposite, where we're concerned about burnout. So we've imposed a mandatory break every day. Um, how are you thinking about balancing that and making sure everyone's staying healthy and productive? Yeah, I completely agree with you about productivity. I think this dispels many of the myths we had about people working from home and how productive they could be. I mean, I see the data of how long people are logged in for. And if anything, I fully agree with your point, they're working too hard. And the new normal does not mean working 12 hours, 14 hours a day. Uh, we've shared what we think as a leadership team, some of our best tips of working from home are, you need to get outside if you are able to for a few minutes every day. You can take a walking meeting. Um, you need to build breaks into your day. That happens naturally in the office when somebody comes by your desk. You have to force that discipline to give yourself a mental break during the day. Uh, I don't yet know, and I, I'd love to hear from some of the other speakers, what it will mean on the other side of this. But I do think that we've proven that you can set up from home and be as productive without the need to show up in an office. On the other side of it, I think people will crave that human contact again, and there will be a rush to have that type of collaboration that we've, we've lost through this. I agree. Um, I tried to give someone who's probably listening a couple of days off and they refused me. They said they have nothing else to do. They yeah, we, we gave our people tomorrow off because market, it's Good Friday, markets are closed, equity market, bond market's closed. And if we didn't say you have the day off, they would continue to work. Mm, that makes sense. Um, tell us a little bit how you're spending your time in quarantine and what you're doing personally as a leader to keep yourself sane and, and happy. Look, I, we're safe we're healthy, we're well cared for. I, you know, I worry deeply about so many people who aren't. Um, we're all getting on each other's nerves, I think like everyone else. I, I try to find the beauty in it. I try to find the joy of the found time. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember that when we get on the other side of this, there are gonna be some lessons learned and it was painful and it will never be worth the price that we paid for it. But if we don't come out of this on the other side, different people with a reset of how to be intentional with our time, uh, I, I think it'll be a tragedy. So I'm trying to enjoy the time with a 13 year old and an 11 year old who during a typical week want less to do to me than I, with me than I would like. Uh, I'm trying to learn to cook. I'm looking at Gwyneth's recipes. <laughs> so I, I need some help, sister. Um, it's one of the things I'm not great at, and um, we'll never get this time back. None of us wanted to be here. It's a horrible, tragic outcome, but we have to find a way to make some beauty out of the time that we have as a family uh, and to take the lessons that we have from this on the other side and, and maintain them. I did a Zoom call last night with about 20 women. Gail Tifford was on it, Mindy, and. Linda Boff from GE and Carla Hassan and Pam Kaufman and some amazing women in this industry who you all know. And we all had that lesson of realizing how much time we waste doing stuff we don't wanna do uh, before this happened. So I have one question from the audience and I'm gonna combine with my final question. Um, being a leader is, is a lot about kind of managing uncertainty for your team. Um, there's more uncertainty now than ever before. How are you translating that, especially for the younger folks on the team? And then the question from the audience is, what advice do you have for, for the younger end of millennials during this time who are only a few years into the workforce and are still trying to find themselves? Boy, that's a really profound question. I, I guess I would say, like, I don't have it figured out either. 
uh, one thing I wish my younger self had known that if, there's never going to be a point at which you have things figured out, including, including during a crisis. Um, I would say to millennials, like, stay the hell at home. I, uh, these pictures of people who are out, not social distancing, like, stay the hell at home. You could get sick too. Um, I, I, none of us has ever been through anything like this, but I, particularly the younger people who've worked for me who don't even remember 2008. You know, there is another side of these things, and it feels like you're in an abyss at the time, and this is a different and deeper abyss, but there is another side to it, and you stay healthy, you stay resilient, and you, you learn. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was very inspiring and useful. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, and one thing, get Gary Vee to tell people to stay the hell at home. They will listen oh, to yeah, him. we will. <laughs> <laughs> 3 we'll p.m., get... he'll say it. He won't say hell. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Kristen. Uh, my love goes out to you, too. Uh, you definitely were one of my C-suite godparents in the early days of building Micmac, so truly appreciate your time. I have so much respect for both of you and with, for Mindy and Gwyneth and Jeff and Hillary and all the other people on this call. Thank you for doing it. We're all in it together. Thank Absolutely. you. You're the best. Well, on that note, I'm bringing up Mindy Grossman. Mindy, if you could take yourself off of mute. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Oh my God, I'm so excited for this. I wish it was in real life so I could give you a big hug. So if folks on the line, you should know Mindy uh, because she's an icon in so many people's minds when it comes to business and leadership and social responsibility. But I'll share a little bit about her. She is currently the CEO of WW, formerly known as Weight Watchers. Prior to that, she was the CEO of HSN. Prior to that, she was the president of Nike and Ralph Lauren. She's on the board of Fanatic. She's on the board of UNICEF. And somehow the universe allowed me to meet Mindy maybe seven years ago. And then I never allowed her to stop being my friend ever since. And you've become uh, my mentor. Don't let anybody confuse it. And I just have to reiterate what Kristen said and thank you for creating a platform and an opportunity for not only us to share our experiences, but to learn from each other. And right now, I think that aspect of community is really important. 100%, and that's what this is all about. And it, it's funny, I was, you know, we have so much time on our hands, I'm now catching up on all my content, and I recently watched the CNBC documentary about you, which came out around February, and there was this amazing quote that I just thought summarized you in a nutshell and this exact moment in time, which is, you have to turn the world upside down to make it happen. Mindy Grossman is the person you call. And I thought to myself, <laughs> wow, like the world has actually turned upside down and you were one of the first people that I text. So, <laughs> I'm uh, really excited to pick your brain. But before we get into present day and what's happening now, I actually thought a great place to start is 2008. Because 2008, you were at a really interesting moment in your career. You were two years into your role as CEO of HSN, you were trying to take the company public and the stock market crashes. I would love for you to just share about that time period in your life and, and what it meant to you and how you navigated that while you were at HSN. Sure, and certainly a lot of the learnings from that uh, has obviously informed some of what I'm doing today, but it was at a very different point in my career. You know, I'd spent two years with Barry Diller running IAC Retail, um, 2006 joined, and then in 2007 relaunched uh, Home Shopping Network as HSN, and the business took off. And then in November of that year, made the decision to spin out and take the company public, which at the time seemed really exciting, um, except I spent the summer of 2008 on the road show and we took the company public in August 2008, right before the world fell apart. And first time public company CEO, brand new board that I hadn't worked with before. Um, but fortunately, we had completely rebooted and revamped the culture, the team, and had relaunched the brand and was on a significant growth trajectory 
even coming into the crisis. Mm. Um, but for, for me, it was really that leadership moment. And I think I was fortunate that at other points in my career, I've always been somewhat of a transformation uh, person. And the learnings from that about moving quickly, having the relationship with the board, making sure your culture is aligned, communicate excessively and transparently, look for innovation. And what I found is the companies in 2008 who leaned in and took offense versus defense and really tried to innovate and relook at all their processes and how they could do them different, they are the companies that came out stronger mm -hmm. on the other side. And HSN actually was one of the few companies that grew in 2008 and 2009. And I would attribute that to the team's efforts to do all of those things, um, even within a difficult time. You know, in the, in the documentary, you talk about this time period and you said that you felt really scared. Like it was the scariest time for you. And the reason being is because you had a massive responsibility to 6,000 people. In that moment, what do you think your employees were thinking? Stock market crashes, rebranding happens. What were their concerns and how did you address them on an individual and a macro level? Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that I say that I was scared, it wasn't about me personally, but not only did I have 6,000 people relying on me, I had their families, their communities, and people were waking up. And look, uncertainty is an anathema to anything. It's what weighs on people's minds. And the important thing for me was to make people feel that every effort was being made with them in mind, with our consumers in mind. Um, and certainly, if we did that and did that well, it would bode more effectively for our business. But you realize you have to become the chief crisis officer, the chief communication officer. Um, you have to be willing. Some people attribute vulnerability with weakness. It's exactly the opposite. People want to feel that you are real. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, but they also want confidence that you will get through this. Mm -hmm. um, and we will, and we did. But you have to over-communicate. You have to make sure that your priorities are really clear, that people really understand what their focus needs to be and what they're galvanizing against, mm -hmm. that if we stay in service of our consumer, that's the most important thing. And I remember we created the mantra, there's never any bad news at HSN. The most important thing, and it's exactly the same in my business today, Mm -hmm. was to keep people engaged, to be the place that they come to for community and for support. And that was a very important element. So all our employees felt they had a purpose in not only helping the company, but in helping others. And that was very significant. It's, it's funny what you say about bad news. So I do quarterly employee engagement surveys. And one of the questions that I ask is, do you feel comfortable sharing bad news with your colleagues and your direct manager. I think creating a culture to do that leads to the vulnerability. I think so. I think the other thing that's really important is not just communicating out. You really have to understand the pulse of your people and the organization and ask what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Ask what the challenges are. So just like then, you know, we have an excessive, you know, town hall process um, both globally, uh, locally, by department, and our leaders know that the most important thing they can do, whether it's in a virtual environment or not, is communicate to people and understand what they're thinking about so we can take that into consideration in our communication. So just earlier, I got off a global town hall from 10 different countries, 2,000 of our corporate uh, people, um, and did a complete Q&A, myself and the CFO, and told people exactly what we were talking to the board about, mm -hmm. what we were considering, what we have to think about. And I think that's really important because you have to reset 
the entire year. It's, you know, that's what everyone's saying. It's impossible to forecast much right now. So control what you can control and then think about how you're going to innovate, not just to manage the business in the moment, but what you can do to make sure that you can kind of get to another side in a, in a way that maybe could even be better. Mm. No, I, I think what you just did right there is the perfect example, like standing in front of your company and saying, we need to reforecast the whole business and we don't know what 2020 is going to look like. like that's an amazing moment. And before we jump into WW, I do have one more question about 2008. When you look back at that time period and all the decisions that you made, what positive decision do you actually feel you made for the business at that time that you would not have made if the stock market didn't crash? You know, I, I think it's less about the decision and I would like to pivot it to the learning. Yeah. yeah. Um, I always have an expression, never waste a good crisis, mm -hmm. you know, learn from it and apply it. And what I really learned were the qualities of leadership and who did have it and who didn't. And it changed a bit in when I go to hire people, what do I look for? Um, you know, it's very, you know, it's not never easy to be a great leader, but you don't really see it when everything is terrific. You see it when, you know, things are challenging. And, you know, I look for people that have resilience, that have led through diversity of business criteria, or I ask different questions now. And, you know, I believe that the team that I have today is, what it is and how they're working together because we're completely aligned on what's really important. Um, and we have collectively, although a lot of diversity, there's a commonality of how, how we lead and how we think of people and how we think of, you know, leading in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, looking back at that time period, final question. Do you feel you made any mistakes that you're now carrying with you and you're saying to yourself, I'm not going to do that again? I think that there are certain things I should have moved even more quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, speed, uh, ingenuity um, is really important. Now, it has to be purposeful. It, there's no such thing as frantic movement, right? Mm -hmm. It's very purposeful movement. Um, but you have to go with, I call it purposeful intuition. You know, what is it you're doing and you have to move quickly. Okay. So um, the timing of all this is quite remarkable because you were on a road show in 2008 because you were taking the company public. Fast forward to just a few months ago, you were on a road show with Oprah, the, you know, Oprah WW Vision Tour. And I remember thinking about you actually on Monday, March 9th because you had just wrapped up this tour. And then literally two days later, the stock market crashes. So I wanna be in your head. It's Monday, March 9th, 2020. What the hell is going through your head? Well, the first thing I was excited about is that the tour started January 2nd and ended March 7th. Um, because I went from being excited about filling sold out arenas of 15, 17,000 people um, to where you know, the world was going. Now, some of the benefits of that, when I think of the people we touched in that time period, 150,000 people and how we had them looking at life differently and how they were gonna communicate that to other people um, and what Oprah was able to convey, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we also now had all of that content that we could utilize for people. So that was the positive part, mm -hmm. right? The second was we had to completely pivot a lot of our business. Just to give you a perspective, you know, we launched at, you know, from Weight Watchers to WW in 2019. 
Um, and you know, I'm thrilled that we're a platform of wellness plus weight loss because it's much more relevant to how we have to talk to people today. Mm -hmm. um, but we're a subscription business and we, yes, all 5 million of our members is on a digital platform, but one third of our business is also face-to-face -face workshops. So we have 30,000 physical workshops a week manned by and led by 12,000 coaches and guides. Um, so, you know, in looking at what was happening, we actually were very proactive and we made the decision to pause our workshops and close our offices before many, many other retailers mm -hmm. uh, did. And our whole lens was the safety and security of our employers, of our employees, of our members, and of our communities. And by being proactive and having a, you know, a, a bit more time in making the decision, we actually paused our meetings on M Monday, I think March 13, 14, whatever it was. We spent the next three days training 12,000 people on virtual workshops. So the HR and training and L&D teams. And then on Thursday, uh, we launched virtual workshops in every country right. manned by our coaches. And we had to repurpose the product in tech teams. Um, we were planning virtual group coaching for later in the year. We knew we needed to come up with a product. Our goal was not perfection in mm -hmm. these times and i think that's a very important thing to think about we needed to deliver a product and the reason why we were able to do it and do it so quickly is because we had agile teams and we empowered them yep. we empowered them um, and the most important thing was to keep our community together and as you know in a subscription business it's all about retention and recruitment and you know there were other things that we did but it's the human factor we cared about. It's the human factor. And I have now sit in, sit, sat in on so many of these virtual meetings. And you realize in an environment where people are isolated um, and they're not able to be with their tribes, mm -hmm. having that connection is so powerful. And here's a 57 year old company that from the very beginning was built on community. And today we could do it so much more, but because of this, the implications and impact of this on our business as we get to the you know the end of the end of the tunnel is actually going to be powerful so these are the times that you know you want to foster innovation and you want to galvanize your teams yeah i i mean i think it's remarkable how fast you moved and your view that perfection is not the end goal right now and I love the fact that you did this all on Zoom. Like if you, if you think about your corporation, for so many people, they would have said, we couldn't do this because we need to build a homegrown solution. And I think that's honestly like why you're gonna continue to win. And um, now you are a public company CEO. So I wanna understand how you prioritize your shareholders in this decision-making. You've, you've mentioned a lot about your consumer, your employees, but how do you balance this with what your shareholders want? So I think the way you have to look at it, if we prioritize our employees and our members and we do the right thing with them in context, but at the same time understand we want the most effective business continuity to keep ourselves going, that's what's gonna create shareholder value. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, you really have to keep that in mind because if I don't have the talent, if I don't have the retention, if I'm not delivering, I'm ultimately not going to keep shareholder value. And look, I have a responsibility to a broad base of constituencies mm -hmm. and I, I, I have to take that in mind. And sure, have we taken significant action around um, expense and around narrowing on our prioritizations um, and, and making hard decisions of what not to do, of course, mm -hmm. um, because there is so much uncertainty right now. Um, but we've really looked at every level of scenario planning. 
We've taken ideas from everywhere. And this goes back to listening. We've repurposed um, different employees in different areas, depending on what we need. I think the other really important thing, uh, and I always say, whether you're transforming a company or in crisis, is a couple of things that are really critical. You have to have an aligned and galvanized culture. You have to have a level of still investment, even if you're cutting back on a lot of other things, because something has to be prioritized because you're not just planning for today, you're planning for what happens forward. And you have to have the support and alignment of your board. And to do that, you've got to communicate with them the same way and even more so. I mean, we're very fortunate. We have a fantastic board with a lot of diverse experience. And if I'm not going to take advantage of that, and my leadership team isn't, then why, why do I have that relationship? And that communication has really been important as well. And then at the same time, um, continue to speak with our key shareholders um, and communicate what we can um, effectively. Honestly, that was a mic drop moment. Uh, I hope everyone wrote that down because that was literally alignment, prioritization, have cash on your balance sheet, speed to market. I mean, Mindy is literally a textbook of a living leader. I know I have one minute, so I wanna do rapid fire. Just pick your brain. Who's the first person you call when it comes to making a business decision during a crisis? I think it's less an individual person. Um, certainly you wanna galvanize your team. If you've built that team, hopefully you want them around you. And I always believe that you need a team that can uh, contribute to what I call productive discomfort and have the right conversations. And then I have a selective tribe um, of other people. You mentioned Declan in the beginning, um, who I really trust and I can call and bounce things off of or ask if they've had experience or um, in some cases, do they know uh, people if I have an idea or a thought? And I think everybody needs to know who their lifelines are mm -hmm. um, and who you need to call. Um, and your lifeline could be, who would you call at three in the morning? Who would you call at three in the morning? And we all have to have those. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, Mindy, thank you so much for your time. Uh, everyone follow Mindy on every single social channel known to man so you can learn from her every day. Um, and well, look, I would say the same thing uh, about you. We've been each other's mentors back and forth. It's fantastic. And you know what you've done and how you're building community and you've built community. Um, I think that's going to be very powerful, not just today, but going forward. 100%. So appreciative. Well, uh, Anda, who is up next? So up next, we have um, Hillary Coplow McAdams. Um, when I was raising our Series B, I met uh, 20 investors, 19 of them were men, and then I met Hillary, and she changed the way I thought about what a good investor means. Um, when it comes to enterprise software, Hillary is the most important executive and operator that you can know. Um, I have her full bio here in front of me, but um, you know, she really built the go-to-market teams um, and, and flywheels at some of the biggest enterprise software companies in the world. Started at Oracle, went to Intuit, then to Salesforce, then to New Relic. Um, she also um, has sat on the boards of Tableau and Duo Security before both of those companies got acquired. And she's now on the board of Data Robot, Zendesk, HackerOne, and of course, her favorite company, Notch. <laughs> so Hillary, welcome to, to the forum. Can you hear us? I think you might need to unmute yourself. I think I'm unmuted. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Welcome, Hillary. Um, I'm sitting so, here in my garden in Northern California. That's, it, I was gonna say, it's a beautiful photo and I'm jealous that you're in California. Um, so Hillary, I, I wanna pick your brain because you've seen um, the perspective of a crisis from different companies and different stages of growth. Obviously, you're now on the boards of a lot of companies and you see across the NEA portfolio as well. Um, when we last chatted, you said something about how when in 2008, you talked to your team, um, I think it was at Salesforce at the time, right? You had just joined um, a few months before. So I want to hear a little bit about how that felt to join as a revenue leader right before a financial crisis. But you turned to your team and you said, 
it is the sales team that's going to get us out of this. And uh, when we were talking, you said, I really think it's the marketing and communications teams that are going to get us out of this one. Um, and so I'm curious, what did you mean in 2008 when you said that to your sales team? What did you mean when you just said that to me about this current crisis? Yeah, I, thank you for reminding me of those comments. So when I think about today, it reminds me of 2008. It also reminds me of 9-11, um, which had that same kind of scary unknown threat that you couldn't really see, but everyone felt under siege. Um, and for those of you on the call who might not remember 9-11, uh, everything stopped. Every plane came out of the came onto the ground, we stopped traveling, we stopped doing commerce. We didn't have sophisticated e-commerce in those days the way we do today. And a lot of us didn't know if we could actually venture out into the marketplace. Um, I was at Oracle Corporation at the time. I was a senior executive. We were actually running a company event in Hawaii. And at the time that the towers were hit, we had 400 people in the air. We lost seven people that day between the planes and people who had been in the towers, often helping people leave the towers, but they got caught in that. So it was this very personal, emotional experience to, to know people who were impacted from that event and for the world to wake up and feel different and unsafe. Um, and in those days, by the way, you could go to the gate with your friends and family and give them a hug and they authenticated who they were with their ticket by getting on the plane. So you can see how much that whole experience changed as a result. 2008 felt like it was structural. It felt like every layer of the economy was impacted. As you mentioned, I had just joined Salesforce. I was running the revenue function. I kinda knew, I had been in China, I had this sense the economy was gonna slow down, but everybody assured me, no, we're the growth darling. We're disrupting the model, we'll be fine. Well, we weren't. We had customers who had built our base of business on basically a mid-market economy, growth economy. We had built the business on a subscription model. We heard Mindy talk about the subscription model at WW. And most, most of our customers were actually on monthly subscriptions at that time. That was part of our disrupted value proposition. That also meant at the end of the month in a crisis, they could walk away. And that meant that we didn't, we couldn't pay our bills. So at that time, what we realized, we did two things. One was we did a worst case scenario plan on how does the company go forward? We were public. We had been public for about a year. So it's a tough place to be as a public company, as Mindy mentioned, as it relates to 2008. But the, the piece that I really embraced was what can we do short term to build for the long term? Because it's inevitable the economy will come back. And when it comes back, you want to be in a stronger position with a better brand. So that's where I really felt that the sales team had the opportunity to engage in the market and engage with customers differently. So both engage with our current customers and help them figure out how to go forward because we were the experts, right, in go to market. That's what we were selling as our value prop. And then also help prospective customers rethink what their strategy should be. So that was about walking out and going into the market. Today, no one can walk out. And it's not clear to us when we can. You know, as somebody who travels like hundreds of thousands of miles every year on airplanes, I don't think that's going to happen for me this year. <laughs> that yeah. might be a blessing. <laughs> Which is nice in a way. Yeah, not for United or any of the airlines I frequent and love, but I probably will not be in New York every four weeks. I probably will be mostly on the West Coast. So that means we have to bring the stories that inspire companies, the ideas, the education to them virtually. And that's really where content and digital, and that, you know, if you think about the last 10 years, how digital content has matured, the mediums have really changed, the way we are as consumers are willing to engage or business buyers has really changed. I think that's the opportunity and that's, and you can probably tell by my personality, I, I try not to look at the half full or, or the half empty. And I really try to focus on what is the half full. Uh, and right now in particular, I think in this two week period, it, it's hard to see the half full, but I'm, I'm gonna push us all on this call to do that. <laughs> 
I love the idea of uh, redirecting your sales team to really think about how they could add value to both prospective and current customers during this time versus be transactional. Um, what other advice would you have for a growth stage company? I know how important it is to gain momentum. I know how much investors care about companies gaining momentum. And I know how hard it is to regain it once you've lost it. What can you do as a growth company to make sure that you're continuing momentum during a time when no one really seems to be in a buying mindset? Yeah, well, that I love the way you frame that question. I think starting out, you have to cut yourself a break. These are extraordinary times. And in cutting yourself a break, a lot of us talk about going back to basics or thinking about why was this company invented to begin with? What was the mission? that we set out to um, undertake. And then how can we do that? And what are the ingredients to that recipe? So, so, you know, high level, everybody will recover to some degree if they can. When you recover, you want to be poised for growth and you want to be poised as the winner. And the way I think about this the analogy I use is there's a pie, it was really big, it's gotten small your parent has put it on the dining room table at the end of a meal. Everyone gets a piece of the pie and you want the biggest piece, right? That's how I think of the economy. And when you're building a growth company, you want a bigger and bigger piece of the pie. So how do you do that? Well, what's great about what's going on right now is people have more time to be educated. So I had a board meeting with a security company this morning. They're saying, you know, security teams of these companies, while they're under siege right now, because unfortunately there are a lot of attempts to breach companies now that we're all working remotely and more reliant on technology, but there's also this desire to be educated. So there's the opportunity for every brand to go out and educate their prospective customers and, and their current customers who maybe aren't deeply using their solutions. There's also the opportunity to commune. And that's what Mindy was talking about, build these communities like this call where we're educating each other and we're professionalizing a community to think about a strategy. And then I think finally, there's this opportunity to inspire through stories. So if I were running a company today, I would go out and find my best customers who have gone through a transformation using my solution. And I would get them to unpack that story, the good, the bad, and the ugly of that story using a forum like this so that you can help educate people what a transformation looks like and how they can put the pieces in place, the foundation in place today to actually go on a journey like that. What's um, interesting about a time like this, and I don't know if it's the, it's the spirit of the American culture, but we're, we don't like being in pain for long. It's just part of our nature. We look for solutions. We look to innovate. You know, we have that great expression that, um, you know, that uh, sometimes you just innovate out of necessity. And that's one of those scenarios that we're staring at today. So there, there's this huge opportunity to go back to corporate America or go back to consumers and help people think differently about what they want the future to look like. I love that. Thank you. There's, um, there's actually a quick question from the audience that I thought I would um, add in. Um, in terms of hiring and thinking through the hiring challenges for a company, obviously we've heard about the crazy high unemployment numbers um, we've heard about companies across the board from a technology startup standpoint, just halting hiring completely. What's your advice for hires who are going to take six to nine months to ramp up? What are you telling your portfolio companies? And Jeff, by the way, feel free to jump in if you want. I, uh, so you're saying, what are we telling uh, companies when it, they know it'll take six to nine months to, to ramp, ramp up? So as you know, obviously a lot of the enterprise sellers take yeah. a while to ramp up to productivity. How do you think about those hires who are going to take time? When do you make that call and start hiring again? Yeah, so this is a supply and demand problem. You have to think about what you think your demand curve looks like and when you need to add to the supply. And this question of timing is the uncertainty for all of us. Yeah. So um, if the economy were to recover a sharp V, like people have talked about seeing in China, um, then you would actually want to bring those people on now because you'd have the confidence that you could 
educate them and onboard them and maybe have them work with current customers so they understand what the value prop really looks like in situ uh, today. But that's the educated guess that we all have to make. So out of an abundance of caution, and this sort of goes, uh, goes back to the last question that Mindy was asked by Rachel, like, what's the thing you wish you hadn't done in the last downturn? I think out of an abundance of caution right now, many of us have to hold off on hiring until we see more signaling that we're coming back, unless we happen to be in that fabulous counter cyclical um, category of like Zoom software or DoorDash, you know, where you're, or Amazon warehousing, where you're just hiring, 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 because you're offering essentially what's critical infrastructure right now. So that's a situ situational based question. Good one. And uh, Jeff, did you want to add something? I, I saw you on mute. You know, I, I would, uh, you know, on the, I think these crises come at you in waves. So I kind of urge the, the companies I work with to think about what decisions you need to make and when you need to make them. I think it's too soon in this crisis to make every profound decision because things will, will you know, six months after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt was very different than the day they went bankrupt. And then the financial crisis, if you move too early or you move too late, uh, you made mistakes. So I think the, the best role of a board and a management team isn't what to do. What to do is actually quite easy. It's kind of when to do it. That, that's what takes judgment. And I think that that's echoes what, what Hillary said. It's making those decisions matter how you go into a crisis and how you come out. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Jeff and Hillary, sorry, Adam, I'm just chiming in. In terms of uh, you know, not making all the decisions at once, how do you properly manage the rhetoric then with your employee base? Like, we're not laying off people today, but in 60 days, we might. Like, if that was the narrative, how would you manage that? Look, I think one of the mistakes that I made uh, too many times was not saying, I, you know, I was afraid to say I don't know. And I think sometimes if you treated your a team well and with respect, you're allowed to say, I don't have every answer right now but let me tell you how we're running the place. Let me tell you what I'm looking at. Right now it means this, in the future it means that. And I think if they trust you, if you've built up enough, you know, when times are good, if you treat people with respect, you lean into that when times are really bad. Because I, I think many times the answer as a leader is, look, I just don't know right now, but I wanna keep this door open while this door might be closed. And I think that's, that's all about judgment. I agree with that. It's a really important time to be authentic. Um, it's, it's okay to say we don't know. I do think every company should have a small squad looking at a worst case scenario, like a 24 month problem, big problem. Um, but that's not everyone in the company. That should not be the culture of the company. The culture of the company should be going back to what's core, what's our mission, what can we control and, and do today in these short sprints. Um, and that's actually where the innovation is going to come from. And it actually might get you out faster. But what I will say is I got really comfortable saying to people, here's what we're going to do now. If we're wrong, we'll fix it. And oh, by the way, we may be wrong going both ways. We may be wrong about your ability to achieve these goals. And if so, we'll revise them. Because, you know, what else would you do as a leader? And if we're also wrong that we underestimated the potential, then we may come back and revise what our goals are and raise expectations. But I think it's okay exactly. with a clean sheet paper in these scenarios. I'm not sure I'd make a promise today that we're not going to lay off people. I would probably say um, for the foreseeable future, we hope we're not put in that position. We will take, we will uh, mitigate our opportunities by maybe asking people to take pay cuts, by maybe asking people, in some cases, companies have furloughed people with the intention of rehiring them, which is great. Um, and a lot of people in these times of crisis will say to me, I'm not going to make as much money. And I'm always struck by that comment. <laughs> and I usually say, yeah, you're right. None of us will. <laughs> like, we're all in this together. No one in the world will probably do better than they were doing. There's a lot of pain out there. So great question, Rachel. Um, 
Hillary, it's interesting how uh, most of the time, kind of in times of peace, it, it feels like the role of a leader is to have a lot of the answers. And in times of crisis, it feels like the role of a leader is to just admit that we don't have the answers and we're going to try to figure them out together. And we will likely also be wrong a lot of the times. And so I, I like that idea. Um, I'm curious, how did you think about galvanizing your team back in 2008? I think especially uh, you know, a sales team that is constantly getting rejected and now even more so, all the doors are shut, there's no budget. Um, how did you get them to still go out there and do their job? You know, we uh, admitted to ourselves pretty early in the process based on the feedback we were getting from our customer base that we had to go to a new plan. And so we devised a plan that really focused on customers at the centerpiece, helping current customers and acquiring new customers. And we revised our expectations down dramatically around top line revenue. We basically said, not publicly, but informally, if we don't achieve growth or the same growth rates in top line revenue, that's okay as an organization. We have to accept that that may be our reality for the next couple quarters or even a year, because again, nobody knew how deep the problems were in the uh, financial system and then kind of as a result, the trickle down into the economy. But what we did know that we could, what we could control was our ability to acquire new customers at much smaller commitment levels. And what was this fascinating kind of human thing that happened was going into 2008, people might remember it was a boom economy and most companies were doing very well. And a lot of people didn't have time for us. They would tell us we're good. We don't need your kind of solutions. Come back another day. And yeah. suddenly those same people were really open-minded about, okay, actually we do want your help. So one of the things that we did was we decided that we had to change our approach in interfacing to customers. We took a playbook from McKinsey where they come in and they do more of a consultative study of your business strategy and come back with high level recommendations on typically a change management initiative on how you can be better. And it's typically more disruptive. This is not an incremental kind of strategic change that they were advocating. And we decided that we were in the best position to be the McKinsey's of the go-to-market strategies of our companies. So we started authoring white papers. We started creating webinars where we had thought leadership around recovery strategies for sales, for service, which were really sort of the flagship solutions that we were representing. And that worked really well. And frankly, I think that changed the way the company was seen from a brand perspective because we were seen as more helpful, more of a strategic partner than a vendor. And I always say, you never want to be viewed as a vendor. You always want to be viewed as a strategic partner. So it actually be, it was a turning point for the company, I would argue. I was on a, on, on a chat yesterday with another one of our investors and he said, th these are the times when the line is um, uh, created between a vendor and a partner. Yes. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's such an amazing opportunity for growth companies to really strive to be a partner at a time like this. Um, Hillary, I'm getting so many questions for you on the Q&A, but we don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna ask you uh, a one quick kind of one minute question. Um, you've worked with some incredible leaders. You're an incredible leader yourself. What are some of the big do's and don'ts of leadership in a time of crisis? What would you, especially I think we've talked a lot about what to do. I would love to hear you talk about some of the not so great leadership actions you've seen um, startup founders take in the last few weeks. <laughs> I'm not turning in any founders. We're all, <laughs> we were all struggling, so it's hard. Don't get me it. 7.30 in the morning when I'm drinking my coffee watching the news. I'm down. <laughs> I'll call you then. <laughs> but get me in the afternoon when I've energized in my garden. Um, look, great leaders do three things. They align the organization, they energize the organization, and they educate, right? They're continually pushing the organization to educate. And by the way, sometimes we do that by marketing to our customer base and consumers. And then our employees sort of get educated through that content. I want to throw that out there for all the content producers. I would say in today's crisis, energizing goes to the top, right? Every day, the leader of a company has to energize their customer base and their employees. 
and help them get going for the day. And then there's the alignment on what is our work? What is the most sacred work that we're doing this week, next week, as this thing unfolds? How do we care for each other? How, how do we care for the larger ecosystems that we play in? And then of course, there's the opportunity to educate people and bring new approaches. I think the thing that leaders that struggle in this environment do is they can't compartmentalize what I call heart and head. What I just described was head. These are core strategies to keep winning, to keep moving forward. Heart takes over and it's heartbreaking right now. And they put their head in the sand. They say, I don't know, I'm gonna wait. I don't, uh, you know, people have said to me, I don't wanna do worst case scenario planning. It's depressing. And yeah. my response is always the same. We have to do that because once you face the reality of the worst case, you can plan. That's why pilots can land planes on the Hudson River in a crisis because they trained for that moment and they've already confronted what would be the worst case and they have a playbook in which they can pull out of the drawer and execute with the head. So I think the key is to kind of you know realize, am I in a heart moment and it hurts? Or am I in a head moment? And then how do you get balanced? I think the final thing that I would say is I'd be really empathetic today. I you know, had a call with um, an attorney yesterday who basically was really engaged at the beginning of the call. And when we hit the hour mark, I could tell he was talking fast. He was disengaging. And I said, hey, we're running over. Are you okay? He said, we have a three-year-old and an eight-month-old and my wife needs me. <laughs> and I realized that's hard like trying to be an attorney in a professional setting, working from home on Zoom, and suddenly, you know, the baby's crying in the background, the family's overwhelmed, that's hard. So I would argue that little moment gave me a little telescope into what people are going through. I have two college students who have been reluctantly recalled to their parents' home. <laughs> that's hard for them, for sure, but it's not as hard as having a three-year-old and an eight-month-old. So be empathetic. Hillary, I love that. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Thanks, Hillary. Gary V is in the house. Gary, if you want to unmute yourself. I am forever unmuted, Rachel. I know. It looks like you're in your office. I know. Some, we took a photo from it. I, I'm loving this, but I'm not. <laughs> okay, you're right home. Here. Okay. By the way, before you go into the intro, I'm, I'm just very humbled to be part of this crew looking at the... Uh, beautiful faces at the top of the screen and then obviously a lot of people watching. So thanks for having me. Of course. Um, we are so excited for you to be here. And it's funny, uh, for, I'm assume folks know who Gary is, but we're introducing everyone. So I'll do a little brief intro. Gary Vaynerchuk is the CEO of VaynerX, which is the conglomerate of so many of his companies, inclusive of VaynerMedia and PureWow. Uh, and he's also a very active investor and made some really smart early investments in companies like Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr. And I like to say McMath too. Uh, one day he'll see that payday. And, uh, first. <laughs> and um, you know, Gary, in preparing for this, I actually learned some new things about you. You know, my perception of you has always been eternal optimist. You are the type of person that I would always turn to when I was in the darkest of times running my business and you would pull me out of it and you would make me see the light. But I was going through a lot of your content over the last two years and you talked about a financial crash coming up for the last two years. There's probably hours of content where you were predicting this moment. So I wanna to talk to you about that foresight and what you have been doing behind the scenes to prepare for this moment for your business. And let's talk in particular for VaynerX. How have you been preparing for this? Um, so the reason I saw, the reason I thought there were, and obviously nobody's thinking pandemic mm -hmm. as a trigger, um, but I, saw, I just saw an enormous amount of companies uh, wasting dollars on things that weren't effective in the macro, maybe on the corporate level. And then in the startup landscape, there's just so many businesses that are, that are not fundamentally sound. They're, especially when you look at the direct to consumer, uh, brands that are, let's say, Series C and D funded, not maybe smaller plays that are practical, uh, SaaS business. You just saw an enormous amount of capital come in through SoftBank, Saudi Arabia, VC in general. You just had a lot of businesses that weren't, were just so over leveraged. They had no, if, if, you know, it's a very simple game. If you couldn't raise another round, 
would you be able to be alive? And, uh, and I think that a lot of the conversation now is navigating through wartime generals versus peacetime generals. Every, you know, every meeting I've had for the last nine days has been looking at the PNL before you go into letting people go. You're worried about bananas. How much do bananas cost in London? I'm, I'm being serious. Like I'm, you're down to those kind of like granular levels, uh, anticipating travel savings. You're just looking at everything. Um, so I just thought there was a lot of financial arbitrage behaviors for stock price, for raising capital, not I'm building an actual business that could get through a tough patch. For me, I've been pretty lucky. I've navigated to, you know, I started VaynerMedia during the downside. And when I was a kid at 24, I, I started growing my dad's wine commerce business very quickly. And then 9-11 happened and 2001 internet happened. So I've, you know, I've been through a couple of rodeos. Uh, I, I, it's, it, you know, back to, and I, I really appreciate the, the empathy and compassion and, and uh, uh, you know, conversation towards the end of the last chat. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I think, you know, having that sense. Um, and so I say this with ungodly levels of compassion because unfortunately my friends and family have already been affected by the disease at the, at the worst levels. If we're, if we're staying within the context of this conversation, mm -hmm. while this all is transpiring, strictly from a business standpoint, there is enormous amount of excitement I think true operators get in these moments. You mm -hmm. know, like, you know, I'd, I'd be lying. I, I want to be transparent. I like being transparent. Uh, I've been invigorated getting down to every single line item under like a complete CAT scan of everything. Mm -hmm. um, in preparation, you know, you know, it's funny in preparation a lot. We, we, we've been thinking a lot about lowering the cost of creative at scale because we mm -hmm. think it's needed. We've been doing a ton of that. We've been reorging. Unfortunately, some of that, you know, we, we kind of postponed it a month ago because we, or three weeks ago, because I was thought this thing was happening. So I was going to wait three weeks, but like, we're going to have to go through our own resets as well, you know, um, because we've been driving down costs to clients around impactful work, whether that's long form video or creative at scale and social. So 18 months ago, we started getting really serious of if we really understand the media landscape the way we think we do, which is there's this incredible arbitrage in auction based media buying. And if we were right about where OTT was going and some of those dynamics were going to go there, and I think we're starting to see that. Mm -hmm then the other side of the equation is the creative cost that fill that pipe if you can really take full advantage of it. So we've been strategic on that front. That's worked out quite well for us. Um, that gave us a lot of the leverage that led to things like the three Super Bowl spots this year. So we gained clout as a creative shop. Um, we've been very focused on driving actual sales for clients, measurable. We think that you know, I really appreciate the conversation of like vendor versus partner. That that really hit me. I was like, oh, subconsciously, that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to get very valuable the last two years, uh, uh, and so um, that makes sense to me. And 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 then honestly, Rachel, I really appreciate that because you're right. I'm 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 a, I think I'm very uh, practical and and, uh, and but. But I'm also an immigrant, and mm -hmm. I, we talk about this like like the, the the practical part of I'm wildly optimistic, but but I am absolutely I've been screaming at the top of my lungs, and and they're loud both for entrepreneurs and companies. Like saving is cool, mm -hmm. and you know, and and I think people are about to learn that right now, um, and uh, and so been doing a lot of behaviors. We're gonna have our pain. We're gonna have some people let go. We're gonna to have to debate furlongs. We're gonna have, you know, we have client, we had a client email us yesterday that just tripled their scope. We're talking seven figures. Email me and said, we might be going bankrupt. You know, like, so, you know, yeah. real life happens. Um, what so, I'm most excited about, I apologize that I'm being long-winded, but I think this may help. Right now I'm in the normal course of business. You know, it's a real honor to have Jeff here. There's, you know, Jack was a real, well, she was a friend of mine. You know, you know, I, I actually am not a, I don't operate in the bottom 10%, that whole model, but I, I'd be lying if I didn't say during this time, I'm, what I'm trying to do is say, okay, before we feel any effects of the pain, what is normal business? Who was, who was a lower performer, you know, that we were, you know, April's kind of the time we do things that was going to happen anyway. We kind of held, you know, the original two weeks ago was I'm going to hold off on that because I want to have enormous compassion and empathy 
uh, during this time. Now that I'm concerned that we may be this way until June, does this rear up again in September? Now I have to, now I have to protect top performers, you know? And so there's a lot of painful emotional work to be done as leaders. Yeah, it's funny, I you know, called up your Claude Silver, your chief people officer, and I got on the phone with her last week. Same thing, we do employee reviews in April. I was like, do I stay that course? Or do I postpone it? And she was like, no, no, you stay the course of business. Um, so you're like me, you spend so much time on the phone with Fortune 1000 brands. I wanna hear from you what you believe uh, their biggest challenges are right now. What do you see as the opportunities for partners to help solve that? I think their biggest challenge is they're gonna have to spend a lot less money to get the same thing done. You know, and, and I think, the most unique thing for me in corporate America, where you know in the Fortune 1000 is, you know, the drumbeat that I've been banging on since I've been here for a decade is like, hey, there's alternatives to some of these spends. At least know them, whether I'm right or wrong, or this and that. So I think I think the big opportunity is for people to try new things that they haven't in the past, or re-kick the tires on assumptions across the board. Mm -hmm. We do that all the time. Like, you know, Honda and I, I love seeing her. Like, you know, like I love Super Bowl, but I, I'm definitely critical on television commercials. I even re-kick the board. I'm re-kicking that now. I've spent more time analyzing regular TVC and remnant television and drive time radio results in the last two weeks than I have in a long time. Because, I, you know, every single thing out of my mouth, back to being a true partner, I want everything strategically out of my mouth during this time to be triple sharp. I mean, I've made my life on that. I feel confident about what I talk about, but I'm taking advantage and broadening out what I talk about. And I think for a lot of people, the reality, this is the biggest, this is a very difficult truth, I think, for our sector. I, I am serendipitous or strategically lucky that I have the Gary B part of being Gary Vaynerchuk, which makes me a practitioner in all my behaviors at scale. The CMO set in corporate America today and a lot of senior brand managers and a lot of senior marketing leaders have never actually run an ad mm -hmm. against a creative variable in 10 of the most meaningful channels, 20 of the most meaningful. So I think this is a great time to look at assumptions and, and become a greater learner. And I think for people that are speaking to them, if you are confident in the value of what you do, there is no more important time to over articulate that than right now because people are gonna come home or doing it now virtually on Google Hangouts and Zoom and saying, okay, I used to have 17 million, now I have 11, I have to take a step back. What is an ironclad contract that I can't get out of, but what isn't? And the conversations I've been having in the last week, I mean, there's been people who razzed me and made fun of me and never considered anything that we do have called me and said, I'm ready to try. And then there's other people who are saying, you know, what we've been doing with you, we are actually going to go to something else that we think is trying to So you have a lot of mixed conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important to articulate your value prop right now because people have to be more fiscally responsible. And that makes complete sense. What about for small, medium businesses where uh, they don't have as much room for experimentation and they're waking up every day just trying to survive. Well, Rach, that set ironically falls into two very distinct groups right now. And I'm probably having more conversations in that world because people are reaching out to me out of fear or excitement. And that's why these are two distinct groups. Smaller businesses today are dramatically more pot committed to digital than their contemporaries, right? So what's ironic about that is see the like the amount of late funded uh, brands that are nervous they're not getting their next round of funding or just lost their funding that are pulling dollars out of Facebook and Instagram have created the, the arbitrage on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat right now to be an even greater deal. So I'm seeing some brands that actually do have money and have their economics right or got fortunate and just closed their fundraising, fundraising they're crushing because their customer acquisition costs have gone down. Yeah, we've seen the same thing. Others are in big trouble because they were burning so much cash and if they didn't raise money this you know, spring, they were finished, but they were gonna raise money. There was so much money, right? That was everyone's forever. They're in a really tough pickle because they don't have money to actually take advantage of the customer acquisition thing that's emerged. So, I mean, I think it really just depends on 
which side of the bucket you are in small and medium. Mm-hmm. Are you on the su- side of the bucket where you're sound and safe and you can actually go take advantage? This is actually time to triple down. If you're on the other side, you have to cut costs at scale right now. That's gonna be extremely painful. You're gonna have to re- and then you're gonna have to innovate after you do that, because that's the bleeding. And then you gotta take a step back and be like, how do I, how do I get my product offering you know, profitable enough against the cost of getting that actual business. You're gonna, we're gonna have to, I mean, what I'm most excited about is people are about to be forced back into actually building businesses, mm-hmm. not, not arbitraging on an Excel sheet. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanna talk to you about your role right now with your, like, I know you have over a thousand employees. What do you see as your most important job right now, you know, three weeks into COVID-19? Making people feel safe. And how are you doing that? Communication, live streams, group emails, transparency. You know, uh, you know. Like I said, we'll we'll have some layoffs or or things of that nature. We'll be transparent about it. You know, here it is. It's done. It's over. It's not happening. But you know, and at the same token, I really appreciate what Hill said earlier. Also, being honest that hey, I'm not God. Like you know, here's. I mean, when I hear that this thing may pop back up. Mm-hmm. I love how everyone's like, hey, this may pop back up in the fall and winter. I'm like, that is catastrophic. You know, like, like you know, you, you start thinking about businesses that Q4 is everything. So I think um, over communicating, uh, you know, there's a weekly leadership call with 50, 60 people that, that is happening every two, three days. I'm doing a ton of little pop-ins. I stayed up super late and had a, uh, you know, a Zoom with the entire Singapore office, which is up to 50 people. And I haven't interacted with them a whole lot yet. And so like that's happened really quickly for us in Southeast Asia. So that, um, replying to everything, jumping into Slack to lighten the mood, just a million, being human. Humanity really matters right now. So just being a human being, I have a, I have a, listen, I have a lot of empathy for a lot of people on this screen right now and definitely people watching. I don't have a board, nor am I publicly traded. I have a no, I have no permission to not be human. There is no other variable above me that I have to worry about uh, other than perception, which I do care about uh, quite a bit, but you know, but, but the truth always wins. So I need to be human and make people feel safe while articulating whatever, you know, concepts we had. We, we, we got caught a little bit financially, knock on wood. We're in a nice spot in the scheme of things. It's that we were so on offense. We were building new divisions and companies and, 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 and shuttering some. And I'm like in the middle of that. And I'm like, ugh, you know, you know, we're just, it's real life business. It's, it's business as usual. The problem is some of that is, you know, we hired 11 people this week but we're also going to let go of some people because it's business as usual. But then can you, at first I didn't think I had to, cause I was like, okay, three weeks, fuck, you know, screw it. We'll give them a bigger, you know, now it's like, okay, bigger severances, but we have to like, you know, it's, it's really intense stuff. It's real life. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to ask you some rapid fire questions. Get your gut reaction. Go. Who do you first call when it comes to making a business decision during a crisis? Um, nobody. And, and by the way, I do, I do not, I, a couple things. One, I think that is a weakness. Two, I, I don't want to, anybody who's watching to think that's cool. I'm sad that I don't, but I'm uncomfortable. I have a process that's very insular, that has very been me for 22 years, that comes from an immigrant family business. It's where I'm most comfortable. I like the accountability of it. I want to be at blame. Uh, that's the true answer. I just hate that I had to give you that answer because I don't like the way it looks, but it is the truth. I wrote it down. He's going to say intuition. So I knew it. Um, it's a very Eastern European immigrant as well. Just uh, my two cents. Yeah. So, you know, me going into a cocoon and going to sleep and then coming up with the answer is usually the strategy. Thanks, uh, Sandra, for backing me up on that. Go ahead. How do you rethink your operating plans when you're thinking about 2021, 2022, 2023? Like, now that this has happened. How does your three- I'm, I, I'm, I'm not right now. I don't think one has to go that crazy. I still do believe that you have four to 12 weeks before you have to really go there. And I, you know, I don't, when you don't have imperfect information, you make bad decisions. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't feel like I have a grasp just yet. I, I, I don't feel the pressure to have to go there just yet. Um, I'm going to take one question from the group because I know we're coming up close against time. Uh, Someone goes, did I hear you correctly? You think you may be seeing interesting opportunities for Remnant TV and radio ad buys? Question mark. 
Yeah, I think, you know, listen, I think I make a lot of headlines because I'm a big mouth and I get excited on stage about my beliefs on digital and emerging opportunities. But again, I think a lot, you know, you know this, like I, I'm unemotional. I have zero emotion towards traditional or, or digital. I think Super Bowl is the best ad buy in the world. I did a fortune cookie execution recently that worked extremely well like a fortune cookie, an ad in a fortune cookie. Where, uh, in Chinatown? What fortune cookies? It was, it was, it was, trying to open fortune is this new little startup. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and they, you could pick by demo. I did it around colleges because I think I skew that way. And so I just did some stuff for my brand. I do a lot of stuff for my brand, a lot of stuff for Empathy, the wine brand I own, and a lot of stuff for my dad's business wine library that I test tactically. And then we scale it up and then we see if it can scale to the levels of our clients. Um, I, I, I still test direct mail quite a bit. Um, so I'm not against it. I, uh, I'm just very excited about digital video done properly, not bought broadly, more narrow. And so um, I'm just, I'm yeah, just but I'm always, looking. I'm always looking. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gary. It's always a roller coaster and a pleasure to chat with you. Um, and I'm sure everyone here learned an enormous amount. I hope uh, everybody does super well and I hope everybody's very healthy and it's really great to see everybody. Gwen, so good to see you. Miss you. Uh, Anda, who's next? Um, so next up we have Jeff Immold, who I'm, I'm going to introduce, but I feel like no one really wants me to, but since we're doing it, everyone knows who Jeff is. So Jeff Immold, maybe some of you don't know that he joined NEA um, in 2018 as a venture partner on both the technology and the healthcare investing teams. Prior to this, Jeff served as chairman and CEO of GE for 16 years, where he led several innovative transformations that doubled industrial earnings, reestablished market leadership, and grew a strong share position in essential industries. He has been named one of the world's best CEOs, three times at Barron's, and while he was CEO, GE was named America's most admired company by Fortune Magazine and one of the world's most respected companies in polls by Barron's and the Financial Times. Um, Jeff, um, as Kristen said, Beth Comstock and Linda Boff were really actually our first customers. Um, they uh, honestly gave me the chance to build the company and introduce me to Kristen and some of our other first customers. And I have so much gratitude for them. Um, thank you so much for joining. And we're very honored great. to have you. And it's great to be here. Uh, and uh, Linda and Beth are great leaders. I miss them. Agreed. Um, so I actually, I, I know I have your, your questions here in order, but I actually wanted to jump on something that Gary said um, around making sure that you have enough data before you make any uh, permanent decisions. At the same time, I feel like I've read the opposite from a lot of the VCs out in Silicon Valley who are putting out um, a ton of content saying, no, you got to be a decisive leader. You have to make the hard decisions as soon as possible. Uh, you know, cut left and right. You probably can cut more than you can, than, than you are currently projecting. Um, how do you think about those those two perspectives? And, so, and you're you sticking me in the middle between being an okay. operator and an investor. Okay, oh, so, I feel like so you stick I'm, yourself there. I'm an operator. I'm an operator at heart, right? I think inv good investors are cynics by nature. That's that's what makes them good. That's not the same trait that it takes to be a good operator, right? So, I think to a certain extent, the advice of you know uh, cut deep and cut now just isn't the way an operator thinks about life. Right, you, you know, what you really want to do is you want to make the decision you need to make when you need to make it. And so it, it requires a little bit of patience. It, you, you need to know what data you need to see in order to make certain calls. And then I, I would take Hillary's advice to heart, which is in your back pocket, you should have a doomsday scenario that's been developed by a small core of people so you know how to how to get through the the process but i think like an operator and i think an operator basically makes decisions they need to make when they need to make them sometimes they're tougher sometimes they're more patient but they don't follow a cookbook approach i think that's dangerous i would also come back to just one thing guys getting through a crisis is a pass fail test it's not pretty okay there's no there's no style points it's a pass fail. So all you have to do is get to the other side. You're going to scrape your knees. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to reverse your course. Just get ready for that. And, and we're in a crisis right now. And there's just not no one cookie cutter approach. 
So Jeff, I wanted to piggyback on that and maybe open this up to Hillary as well, who's also caught in this world between operator and investor. Um, she talked a little bit about this idea of the head and the heart. You have this worst case scenario, but you're waiting to see more data. When do you know you have to pull the trigger? You're an operator, you, you've built this team, it's a family, you've invested so much in this culture. Um, how do you know when the time is right? So let me just, and Hill's got great judgment on this, but I, I'd say if you put yourself in the current crisis, I would say once you understand where all the government programs are gonna go, for instance, and how much is available for small business, you need to make a decision, right? Because to a certain extent, the government is a big actor in the, in the crisis we're in today. Right now, you don't have clarity around that, but you will in a week or two. So there's a big linchpin there. I think it's really incumbent on everybody here to have connections in China so you can see what progress is being made. There's many differences, don't get me wrong. But, but they are kind of four or six or eight weeks ahead. So you get a sense that if you're in healthcare, it seems to bounce right back. If you're in heavy industrial, it, uh, it's hard. And if you're in the digital space, you're really advantaged in, in, in that world. So I think find a source of information that you trust that you can use to make decisions. I think that's, that's, the, way, that's the way I always did it. And, you know, in the... Um, Look, in the, after 9-11, we made the decision not to cut R&D uh, in the aircraft engine business. And that gained us, that one decision gained us 20 points of market share, right? And that's, believe me, if you were in the commercial aviation business on September 12th of 2001, you had no idea if planes would ever fly again. So you just, you just need to, that should be the whole debate that you have with your, with your senior team and with your board is kind of what decision you need to make and what data you want to see before you make them. So essentially, this is not a binary decision. Ultimately, you have to look at what are the drivers in your business and to decide where you want to double down and where you want to divest. And you do that by turning to your leadership team and to your board and, and getting data that you can trust. Kill the PowerPoint, get used to frequent stand-up meetings, get in the flow of conversation. And then I think to just go back to something Hillary said is, look, most times your team's interests and the company's interests align. During a crisis, there's not as great of alignment, right? Because the, many decisions are gonna impact your team. And, and therefore it's just incumbent on the leader to be a great communicator through that, through that time period to, to really describe to your team what decisions you're making and why you need to make them, even though they're hard. And look, if you ever, if you ever lose your soul about how people that work with you are treated, there's something wrong with you, right? And in a crisis, you need it more than ever. Thank you. I feel like I needed to hear that, so I appreciate that. Um, Jeff, you wrote this LinkedIn post that Hillary actually shared with me, and um, I've read it about 20 times. Um, it's become like a little bit of a Bible, a new Bible for me. And you have this incredible advice there around kind of what to do and what not to do as a leader. Would you mind sharing a couple of those high level do's and don'ts? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, I think as a leader, you need to be a great communicator. You need to have kind of a flexible point of view. So, so the conversation we were just having on the, about, about that, you need to be able to compartmentalize in terms of what actions need to be taken today, but what you want to preserve, you know, what hard actions, but what long-term strength do you want to preserve? You need to be empathetic with your team. And I just think good leaders know how to absorb fear. They know how to not make their teams feel every burden that they're feeling, but really just be transparent, but help them get across this crisis to the other side. Hold their hand and help them get there. So that's what, that's what you should do. I think, I think what you should do is, again, earlier, you know, I, I wish I had said, I don't know more, you know, so you shouldn't be overly confident when you really don't know. And then the other thing is, look, if you have tough organizational moves to make, don't have your HR leader do them, do them yourself. I see, you know, I ran a company with 300,000 people, you know, the, the hard stuff with people, I handled a lot of those myself. 
Uh, and I see small companies making the HR person be the bad person. And, and that doesn't work here. So be really, this is a time when your organization needs to feel your presence all the time, right? It doesn't mean that you have to do everything yourself, but they should feel like your presence and, and, and your, your spirit isn't a part of everything that happens. So you can't hide away from the truth of the situation. I, I like that. We talked a lot about how much more leaders have to take on um, the fear, the uncertainty, the stress, doing the hard things. How did you look after yourself as a leader during the, the many different crises that you lived through? What were, what were your routines to make sure that you come out of this um, you know, healthy and sane? Yeah, look, so I think it's, it's really important to maintain, you know, I've always had a, a really exceptional family life. So it's good to have people that are out of the line of fire who you can plug into. I think it's always good to, um, you know, have other diversions, whether it's exercise or reading or things like that. But I, I think it's mentally, everybody who's on the phone today, you have to pace yourself because this is gonna come at you in waves. We aren't even, look, we are just at the beginning of this crisis. We're, we're not even halfway through. There's more tough stuff yet to come. So you really have to pace yourself and try to get sleep and things like that because, and then when you're at home at night, you just have to know that you've done your best. People, your team, nobody, your investors, nobody expects perfection. They just want progress. They just want one foot, ahead of the other. And let me tell you, like, here's the best news of all. These crises make you better. <laughs> you know, the fact is, unless you've flown close to the sun once or twice, you're no good. You, you know, you don't have a sense for good days unless you've really been through some bad days. And I think what Gary said earlier is there's been so much waste in the system the last few years. It's just, there's some of this that'll be healthy in terms of how we think about running our organizations going forward. I love that. Um, Jeff, in, in your post, I remember you mentioned that entrepreneurs should not wait for a return to normal. Um, and yet I feel like a lot of the entrepreneurs I talk to are just bracing for, you know, a few months, trying to make some hard decisions, but really waiting for things to go back to how they used to be. How, how do we escape that mind? I mean, first of all, do we, do we escape that mindset? Um, should we expect that the world looks very different? But then second, how do we conceptualize a world that we don't even understand, you know, how, how it's really going to exist, given all the uncertainty that is coming at us. What's the best mindset for entrepreneurs to be in at this time? So just as a macro comment on that, I would say that the ability to deal with uncertainty, which nobody likes, but that is a critical attribute with or without this crisis. The crisis only makes it more profound but with all the technical and geopolitical disruption that's going on, you just, you just, you have to find a way to navigate your company, yourself, your, your team through a time period of great, of great uncertainty, number one. Number two, just think about all the things that, that people have learned to do over the last three or four weeks, whether it's uh, virtual meetings, whether it's uh, new digital structures, things like that, that are new knowledge for them in terms of what is the art of the possible. And because you learn, people learn quickly, you're not gonna snap back and start doing things uh, the old way. And I think to a certain extent, kind of internet-based models and digital models are gonna be advantaged coming out of the crisis in ways that they were, you know, they were certainly heading that way, but in ways they haven't been in the past. And then I would just go back to what Hillary said about 2008, you know, in 2008, um, a SaaS model was a novelty in 2008 because everybody had to cut their budgets and get more efficient. It went mainstream and, and that created hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap for companies that were there at that moment in time. So I, I just think this is not going to be like one day you suddenly get back and say, okay, everything's great again. There's going to be ramifications in healthcare. There's going to be ramifications in uh, company's profitability and a series of things like that. But you have to, as a leader, you have to sit and say, that's okay. That's okay. We're going to deal with it. We're going to try to find a way to make an advantage out of it. And, and that's just the way it's going to be. Um, 
I'm curious, what do you think the role of, uh, of the board and your investors is during this time? Obviously, you're now on a lot of boards. You used to be an operator. Um, how does that dynamic change during a crisis? I think during a crisis, you know, on the, there can be no wasted motion. You know, there's, in a normal day, all of us waste time. We waste time in meetings and phone calls and stuff like that. I think, I think when a crisis happens, you have to distill everything down to the essence of what's important. What do I need to do today? Who do I need approval from? And so I think from an investor and a board standpoint, you need to re reach an interaction that is pure, that is non bureaucratic, that is the kind of knowledge that needs to, you know. So I think as a founder, you need to be talking to your board more frequently. You just need to. If your board, sorry, Hillary, I, I know it's not you, but if your board asks you to do seven different scenarios, full PL, and do it by next Tuesday, you should politely say, I'm not gonna do that right now, <laughs> sorry. I just don't know, you know, that's, and so I think, I think the CEO earns a ticket to say, I'm going to push back on you today because it just, you know, guess what? I don't know what revenue in the fourth quarter is going to be, you idiot. What's wrong with you? And, and on your side though, the board has every sense to say, Anda, um, what are you thinking right now? What are you talking about? And so when I call the CEOs of startups I work with, I just ask them to talk me through, how did you spend your time today? What did you do today? Describe your day to me. Did you do this? And I'll sit back and say, well, no, thanks for the information. But like between two and four, that was a complete waste. My advice to you is spend time doing something other than that because it's just not that important. I think that's the one value. Jeff, I, Jeff, what's, I feel like that there's a right answer and a wrong answer. What's a waste? Tell us what, what's wasteful time spent as CEO during the crisis? I think doing too many internal meetings that are plan oriented and things like that right now is just wasted motion. I think, I think thinking through um, how, whether or not you plug into any of the government programs, that's high utility, right? So, so you need to think about the way things are going to stack in. And then what I would say on is, you know, handle the cost cutting stuff, even though it's emotionally difficult, it's not intellectually that difficult, right? So, so try to handle the budgetary stuff with dispatch. And then don't cancel the meetings that are really about what's the next product launch I, I need to have. How does the how does the 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 the, the uh, pandemic impact that things like that? So that's handle the easy things easily. Handle the important things first, and try to push back on the nonsensical stuff. Time time should stop. Time stopped like March whatever seven. We reset time. We can't afford to waste time. And we never think about each other's opportunity costs when times are good. But when times are bad, the most respect we can pass to one another is not no friction, right? Make decisions when we need to communicate easily. If somebody's putting together a 30 page PowerPoint pitch right now on this day, they're friggin' crazy, right? <laughs> it's just like, just don't do that. No matter where you sit or what you're doing. Um, Jeff, one final question. This is uh, from the audience. What happens with capital flows during a time like this? Um, and I, I'll give you just a little bit of context. My co-founder sent me the screenshot. Um, what VCs are saying to their portfolio, cut all costs, make sure you have 24 months of runway in the bank. What VCs are saying on Twitter, we're open for business. <laughs> we're investing more than ever before. What, what happens uh, during a time like this? Uh, well, you know, let's, are let's VCs really those, open? Let's put those into two different things on that. You, you know, don't run out of cash, okay? That's fundamental. That's more important than the valuation, your stock price, the valuation of your company. Uh, we're now into like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, cash. So, so cash is critical and having more cash is better than having less cash. And that's your responsibility of a founder to, to do that. But I differentiate that from saying, okay, let's make all our cuts on April 2nd, 2020, we're gonna make all our cuts that we need to make for the next two years. That's crazy. That's, that's, not, that's not the way an operator looks at what he or she has to do. What they're gonna say is, look, I'm gonna do a salary reduction of 10% today. I'm gonna line up you know, these kind of moves out four weeks. 
And so like and during the financial crisis, which was the closest analogy, just because it was so dark, it was hard to see, you really didn't see the daylight, right? You, you didn't really know what to do until the middle of 2009. So Lehman Brothers went bankrupt on September 15th of 2008. You re if you were in financial services, you really didn't see what door you needed to go through for nine months. This is going to feel a little bit like that, you know, Honda. You know, in other words, you don't know which. So, so I, I hate to be like, give you too much paradox. Don't run out of cash. <laughs> An operator needs to trust his or her instincts about how to operate their company and what decisions they need, need to make and when they need to make them. Well, I think taking opposing views and making hard decisions is what we're supposed to be doing as founders. So I appreciate the advice. Thank you so much, Jeff. Such an honor to have you on. Thank you. Um, I wanted to to move on to our final speaker, who um, I I want to actually first of all thank Zoom for making it very hard for Gwyneth to register um, to the session because as a result of that I got cc'd on an email with her um, and of course we registered her immediately for the session, but. Um, because I'm an entrepreneur and I see opportunities when, I, when I'm when i CC'd on emails with Gwyneth, um, I invited her promptly to join, um, not just because of who she is, but also because she's running one of the most successful companies in the lifestyle business and she's a fellow NEA founder. Um, welcome, Gwyneth. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This has been so You've been taking notes. I, I could see you You've been putting on your glasses and taking notes. Um, okay, so I'm going to read a quick introduction. Of course, again, not needed. Um, Gwyneth is an Oscar and Emmy award winning actress as well as a decorated author, singer and entrepreneur. In 2008, Gwyneth founded Goop, a lifestyle brand devoted to helping women make their own choices count in every facet of their lives, including fashion, beauty, wellness and the home. As the CEO of Goop, uh, Gwyneth has led the company to exponential growth with the empire expanding to the Goop Lab, a Netflix TV show, and live events such as the brand's renowned In Goop Health Summit. Gwyneth is no stranger to pushing important conversations into the mainstream as she helped to facilitate the hashtag MeToo movement, and she has a history of advocating for women's rights and wellness throughout her career. Thank you for that, Gwyneth. I've heard so many great things about you as a leader from uh, the NEA team um, and from other founders who've seen you talk at a lot of different tech events. Um, if you're like Rachel and I running your company, you, you probably started thinking about what COVID means for your business, either in mid-Feb or early March. Can you share with us what were some of the first decisions that you made as, as a CEO? Um, and we'd love for you to touch a bit about uh, on your um, business operations, you obviously have a supply chain that you have to think about, your employees, um, as well as your marketing. Well, I think what I would say first is that this is a situation where my um, profound optimism didn't serve me that well in the first couple of weeks. I, um, I was hoping that we would be less impacted as a country, as small businesses, as individuals, as families, et cetera. Um, once I started to see the impact, um, I had to switch very quickly to a different way of thinking. And I actually, it's become one of the most um, inspiring lessons of this whole time, which has been trying to hold multiple aspects of ourselves and multiple emotions at the same time, which normally don't seem to pair together. Um, so having to hold on to empathy and community while you're making decisions that are fiscally responsible for your business and, you know, to ensure that there, there is a business there when we come out of the, of the other side of this. Um, and I would say I'm just trying to remain as agile as possible and as uh, open-minded as possible. I think the landscape changes every single day. We're watching consumer behavior change every single day from what people are, you know, just in our purview of what's on site, what people are searching for, what people want, what people are buying. There's a lot of psychographic data in a way in what we get to see and what people are, what's resonating with people. Um, and I also think it's been really clarifying and interesting for so many of us to think about, you know, what are the aspects of our business that we need to lean into? Or are there aspects of our business, you know, in always trying to 
uh, diversify revenue streams and these new direct-to-consumer models? Like, are there things that are kind of barnacles on the boat, for lack of a better word, that we need to take this opportunity to, to streamline and to really get back to the core of what our businesses all are? And so I, I actually feel much like Gary, a bit excited and inspired by that particular aspect of what this terrible situation is bringing to the table. So you mentioned barnacles. What are you leaning into right now? Well, I think, you know, for us, we, we are really a wellness business at our core. Um, and wellness can take many forms. It's not only ingestibles or content around, you know, how to optimize yourself. But I think we had um, people really started to obviously want to come to us and and understand um, what they can be doing and it and 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 it has changed over the last couple of weeks, right? So first, it was all about ingesting COVID information and having our in-house scientists collate and refine information and. Um, and ways in which people can help and all of that sort of first responder mentality that we that we get into how can how can we help what should we do how do we stay safe um can i bolster my immunity all of that kind of thing um so we we were leaning heavily there because we just wanted to be of service more than anything else um i think what i found so interesting is you know, I said this to the team the other day when, because we're, we're in the midst of making some difficult decisions and, you know, my team has heard me say since last year, you know, that my priority is, is profitability and a find, finding all of the operating leverage we can out of the business. And um, I said to the team the other day, my, my priority right now is no longer profitability and it's no longer revenue. It's being of service. And bringing the community together, offering people what they want and why, why I started this thing by myself in my kitchen, you know, with WordPress and MailChimp 11 years ago, it was to make connect, help people make connections that hopefully would be meaningful to them. Um, so really getting back to that. And, and, and it's been interesting actually to see revenue rebound. The more that we've, the more that we've leaned out of anything transactional, the more that we pull down our performance marketing assets that felt off and wrong, the more that we're seeing revenue rebound. So it's, it's actually really interesting and sort of perplexing and not what I expected. Part of what you just said kills me as a performance marketer, but I also 100% understand. I love it because I'm a content marketer. <laughs> but no, but like, uh, like quick anecdote, um, you know, when I ran Digital at Gap, when we pulled promos, it took nine months, but then the business rebounded. So it's the exact right. insight you're talking about. But so I think in terms of the performance marketing piece, you know, it is interesting what Gary was touching on before. You know, there, there, you can buy it if, if you want to, if it's right for your business. There are, there's, you know, it could be an opportunity to lean in. I think, you know, if it feels really off to sort of, for us anyway, to talk about, you know, hey, buy this thing, it's great. But you know, if we are allocating those dollars towards a more top of funnel, you know, brand marketing, and, and we can get people into the site because we're, we're being of service and that leads to conversion, that's great, but that's like not what we're focusing on. No, no, yeah, that's the holy grail. Um, so it's, it's hard to, to talk with you and not state, like talk about the obvious. You know, you're not just a CEO, you're also a public figure. And so we're in this crisis. And how do you see your own role right now as a public figure and a CEO of a well-known company? Yeah, it's tricky, you know? It's, I, it's something that I think I'm trying to find the correct balance. Um, I'm a little bit allergic to celebrities opining about things and being overtly political. Um, it's just, just for me, it's not, it's not my thing. Um, but I also do recognize that you know, I have created a business that is a hub for people and for information. And, um, and I, and so I want to be supportive for people. I, I have to say, like, I, I think I probably should be a lot more sophisticated around how I, as Gwyneth Paltrow, engage with the public on social. I, I'm not, I just sort of like, I act from the heart and I, you know, post sort of what I feel at the time. And, 
what I'm focused on and, and what I'm doing. Um, I think that there are people who are a lot, a lot better and more sophisticated at that than I am. Um, but I, I think it's also, you know, it becomes about owning, or I guess I should say, you know, in order to really own your position or in order to step into how the world perceives you or what you, what they want from you, it, you know, it requires, um, an honesty with yourself and about who you are and where you are in time and space. And even though I've been a public figure for a really long time and been famous for a really long time, I've always had discomfort there in that space. So it's been interesting. You know, I think also it brings up a good point, which is all of the things that bring up discomfort during this time are really the things like the, the things in a broader sense that we need to be looking at and unpacking about ourselves, about our businesses, about everything. No, absolutely. And um, when you're making decisions for Goop, how do you compartmentalize your role at Goop, being a public figure, being a mother, and right now speed is of the essence. So are you compartmentalizing those things? Are they all blending? Yeah, I mean, it's, I have to say, and um, I find this working from home thing, I'm really, I'm trying to figure it out. It's it's really hard because, you know, I am a mother of teenagers and, um, and I, and I lead a, a team that relies on me and I'm, I'm finding it difficult. You know, it's like, I'll be on an important call and my, my son will come up and ask me to make a snack. And I'm like, this is, I think because I've been so compartmentalized, I go to work, I work when I come home, I try to, in the evening, I try to really put things down and be present, um, for if they need me. And so I think all of us who are parents or who aren't parents is who are, are forced into dealing with this idea of like, where do we draw lines? How do we take care of ourselves during this time? And I think also for us, for me anyway, and for so many CEOs, we feel such an inordinate amount of responsibility towards our teams. How are they psychologically? Are they okay? How's communication? How's productivity? So it's almost like I feel like myself and a bunch of the CEOs that I talked to were almost working <laughs> twice as much now that we're from home, you know, because we haven't figured out exactly how to recalibrate towards this, you know, for this new work at home situation. So um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to quote Jeff and say, I don't know. I don't know how to do that right now. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to, you know, inbuild certain boundaries and, um, and figure it out. Um, Gwyneth, just so you know, I'm getting so many texts right now from um, marketers who are saying, preach Gwyneth, because you were talking about the importance of content. Um, Jess, who runs marketing at Dropbox, was we talk a lot about how do you collapse that funnel and how do you find efficiency? So thank you for that. Um, obviously, we talked a little bit about this idea of worst case scenario planning. I'm sure you got the same advice from your board, plan for the worst case, head in the heart, how did you think about that? What does the worst case really mean to you as you currently think about it? Um, and when did you start planning for it? Well, worst case means that everything goes to zero, right? So our retail has gone to zero because we've had to close all our stores. Um, I, I would say that our multi-brand fashion business has, hasn't gone to zero, but it's, it's, it's not performing the way that our other verticals are performing. Our wellness verticals are overperforming. Um, it, it's, I think, as you know, as we go forward, I think what we're gonna have to really always focus on again is um, where, you know, lean into the core business and where are the efficiencies. Like, I, I hope our business doesn't go to zero. I, I don't. It, it shouldn't. It's not trending to do that. And I don't think you can realistically build out that scenario, right? Because it's like then you're closing your doors. Um, I think for us, it's really looking at the leanest week so far and, and, and understanding there's been a ramification in our brand partnerships vertical, of course, understanding where retail is going to annualize more or less. Again, as was touched on before, there's so much uncertainty. Um, so what we've been doing is building out kind of a, our version of a disaster and then a low and a mid and really just grinding out every dollar we can. And you know, hoping that it's not all coming from heads, which I don't think it's going to. But I also, again, like we have, we're finding all of these efficiencies all over the place. Like we, we've now adopted this mindset. And so we're finding duplicative, 
you know, software. We're finding that we don't really need to spend this much on creative costs. We're finding that there are, there's, we've, there, we can really, really tighten up. Um, and of course, you know, and I'm sure everybody's talking about this, but we, if we, we had some mezzanine debt that we raised that we pulled down, you know, for an eventuality like, or just a rainy day. And obviously we've been spending the better part of this week analyzing with NEA and our other VCs, what is available to us in the SBA relief package. And I would obviously really encourage anybody that that might be applicable to, um, to, to lean hard into that because there's real relief. Mm -hmm. It's very employer where, where, the whole weekend, Anza and I were texting about it. Yeah. <laughs> Call your accountants. Um, where, where do you take in uh, data from? Who, who's your kind of uh, conciliary during this time? Do you turn to your board? What data do you trust and where do you get it from? For in, external data or internal data? External data. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're we're lucky. We have the we have the best VC in the world. NEA is our biggest investor, and they're um, have been so incredibly helpful. And um, you know, more more than anybody else, like NEA are the people. My and my my investor Tony Florence, who's you know my biggest mentor and my biggest supporter, and the person that I call in a crisis. Um, he and with the whole organization behind him, they've just been so helpful. There have been multiple webinars and um, very tactical advice on what to do. And especially with these affiliation rules, which have gotten super complicated and are looking up for us VC-backed companies, um, they've just been in incredibly helpful. So um, Tony actually negotiated my valuation, so I have a love-hate relationship with Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I agree that he's amazing, and I agree that NEA is the number one VC firm. Um, Rachel, over to you. NEA is not my VC firm, but I still have a lot of love for them. Uh, <laughs> so selfishly, I want to talk to you a little bit about e-commerce. You have a lot of insight into it. Um, from your perspective right now, I'm curious where you've seen a decline and like what specific categories, and then where you're seeing pockets of growth. Yeah, so um, again, multi-fashion is not where it normally is. Um, and and uh, beauty is beauty's hanging on, beauty's good, it's okay. You know, we're, we're not a color cosmetics company. We make clean, efficacious beauty. Um, so we're, we're okay there. Um, although we haven't been marketing it at all and that's normally our number one, you know, that suite of products is what we market. Um, and the wellness business is doing very, very well. It's very strong. And, and interestingly, home. You know, I think mm -hmm. we're home and we're looking around like thinking, oh, this, this, you know, cup is chipped or whatever the case may be. Work, home workout, home workout wear and lounge wear is all doing well, holding steady. It's really just um, our more kind of contemporary and designer clothing that I think people, it's just not the right time. Yeah, and that makes complete sense. From a supply chain aspect, have you been impacted in terms of where you're developing your products? So far, we have not. Um, our co-manufacturers are largely in the United States, and so when uh, we do get some components from China, but luckily, luckily, so far, we're okay. That's great. Um, I think we want to do a few rapid-fire questions with you and then take some from the audience. Okay. <laughs> And slightly different than the other folks. I'll take the first one. Uh, so we have a bunch of fellow founders on the line. Um, and what's the one thing that you believe they should be focused on right now? If you're a CEO of a you know, business less than 500 people. Preserving, preserving the business at all costs to get through it. So, you know, I know it's sort of like a, all of our VCs are telling us, make sure you have 18 to 24 months runway, but I think that's incredible advice. We just we just have to get through it and 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 again really focus on the core business. Yeah. So to Hillary and Jeff, um, similar question for fellow investors. What's your number one advice at the moment? I you know I think it's really about finding the opportunities in or the yeah, silver line. Uh, is a nice way to think about it because it because there is so un, so much uncertainty. It's unclear how to go big and how to go long, but I think we can increment our way to a better place. I think 
what has struck me in listening to Jeff and Gwyneth and Gary is uh, for some people, this is just going to be terrible. Um, and for a lot of us, we have to figure out how to hold on and sort of knowing where you are is important. Um, and because there are no averages in this, there'll be extremes of outcomes for people. So trying to figure out where you are and then making the best of it. Do you think there's going to be breakthrough companies that are counter cyclical, I think you called them? That yeah. VCs are going to kind of rush to invest in at the same valuations as before? Or do you think there's a correction regardless? It's hard for me to comment on where valuations will go. I will tell you everything was in my mind priced for perfection and we're no longer in perfection, right? And frankly, I believe these moments of scarcity, which this is in the most extreme form, actually help us innovate. So I do think there'll be counter cyclical companies. I hope that the healthcare category changes and how the government thinks about, you know, the, the potential risks around pandemics, which people have been predicting for a while, but we didn't really fortify in advance for. So I hope that there's more planning in the process, just as I have the confidence that the banks are in a better position today than they were pre-2008. I hope that the healthcare service delivery, inventory, the ability to anticipate that, um, you know, uh, we need antibiotics that are more effective as these superbugs thrive, as new viruses arrive, novel viruses, that there'll be more innovation. What I've been blown away by it, are the number of companies who have pivoted to help the national cause. That's where it feels like a wartime response. These young, brilliant engineers, scientists, founders, product leaders who are saying, hey, we can take our factory and we can build this, or we can fix this problem, or we can model what a better version of what the outcomes could be. So I think there's this amazing innovation going on. And in some ways we've all been like the handcuffs have been taken off and we've all risen to the challenge. And you know, so I think maybe following up what, what Gwyneth said as well is it's a good time to compartmentalize. I actually think, you know, coming up with scenarios on cost, it's emotionally difficult, but intellectually not that hard. Right, it, it, and it can be done relatively quickly. So if you can kind of get that plan in your mind so that you can really spend enough time thinking about what your company looks like coming out of this thing. I, I actually think that's what a leader can really help with right now. You know, you're gonna have to take tough actions. Those are emotionally hard, but not intellectually that hard. But figuring out what your company looks like in six months that's where a lot of your intellectual horsepower should be. Because that's going to, you know, look, I'm the old person here, and I can tell you there is, there is the morning after. There is, there is things that happen in the, uh, in the future, and you want to make sure you're there to kind of, like, recognize that. Uh, maybe a last point, just what Hillary said. Look, we're really good as a society of, of solving yesterday's problem, and that's what happened with the banks. So I think if you look at the healthcare system, population health, rural health, screening, vaccines, things like that. There's going to be a ton of money that gets put into all of those, uh, all of those things. You can count on that. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, um, Gwyneth, Hillary. This has been incredible. Thank you to all the other co-hosts who have thank you guys. Um, dropped off. Um, we're going to summarize all of this advice. We're going to put it in an email and send it out. There's, there's so much wisdom here. Um, and I feel so inspired. I don't think we can we can do better than this, Rachel, next week. I don't know what we're going to do. Um, I, but it's all downhill you. from here. We peaked. It's like high school. It's over. I know. <laughs> um, well, thank so, you. Uh, this was amazing. We learned so much. I, you know, to quick wrap up key things that I think we're taking away. Prioritization. Cash is king. None of us have all the answers. We have to really live in the moment, lead with humility. Um, and come together as a community because look at all the insights that were just shared today. I'm sure everyone's going to take them back to their respective businesses and apply it. We appreciate all your time. You can find us here next week. You'll see emails from us. Thank you so much. Thank you.